Hello and welcome to the uh, tonight's edition of Lessons of Vietnam. Here we are on Thanksgiving Eve 2019. It's hard to believe we're almost done with the year. Uh, our show tonight is going to be, I uh, hadn't thought about it before, but it's a great show for uh, Thanksgiving Eve. And we're going to be talking about some real heroes. You know, uh, now we have a tendency with what's going on out here in the world. We look at our fellow men and say, you know, they're all crazy or out for themselves. But we're going to be talking about some men uh, tonight that um, uh, gave everything for what did they give everything for? It wasn't for the United States of America. It wasn't to stop communism. It wasn't for mom and apple pie. It got right down to it. They gave everything for the guys they were with their buddies out there in the jungle, uh, the guys, they uh, went through all the all the hardships and uh, the good times and the bad times and with, they gave everything for it. So that's what we're going to be talking about tonight is the heroes. We're going to be talking, tonight's show is going to be uh, part two of the uh, of Medal of Honor. And as we get going here, uh, as always, I'm your host, Bill Dixon of the Vietnam Show. We are broadcasting from the International Word Headquarters of Nissan Communications. And if you need to get in touch with me to get tell me something or whatever, you can see my uh, email address there. It's dixonbill80 at yahoo.com. Uh, we also encourage you to uh, take part in the show if you'd like. Uh, the best way to do it would be uh, to go on to Skype and go to Computers 2K Voice. Or, if nothing else, give us a call at 919-518-9773. Uh, make a comment. Ask a question. Uh, tell me that I've got something wrong. Whatever it is you want to do, as uh, long as it's visiting about the show, I, I, you know, I don't want you to come on and tell me that it's going to rain tomorrow or anything. I keep it, keep it to the subject we're on anyway. Uh, okay, now let's talk about something that's also very important this time of year. This is a tough time for a lot, a lot of people. Uh, especially veterans and so forth. Uh, veterans Crisis Line. If you are a veteran, you know a veteran, call this one of these crisis lines. There's somebody there, a trained person, waiting to talk with you. Uh, I am on Facebook to a lot of the uh, veterans, uh, different sites, and um, one couple, uh, night full last, I guess it was, it was someone that was really despondent and, uh, it was amazing how people who reached out and, and told him to hang in there a little bit longer and so forth. There's somebody out there, uh, wanting to help you. Uh, there's something to be thankful for, uh, this time of year, no matter what your circumstances are. Let's go ahead and get into the show now as we get started. And now let's talk about the Medal of Honor. Oh, Thanksgiving. Okay, I forgot to forget this one. Uh, Thanksgiving in Vietnam varied from what time you were there in the place. Uh, I never, the top left picture there is uh, is actually sea rations on a, on a metal tray. Now, I never used a metal tray when I was eating my sea rations. Uh, and then you see down there the uh, nice uh, menu that was printed. And you see the guy, looks like he's probably in caisson there eating his uh, Thanksgiving in the middle, and then it's a nice plate. That's probably one guy right there with two, two different plates. And as we go along, and a lot of a lot of people didn't get a chance to have that Thanksgiving because you see the bottom picture there, the war kept right on going. Uh, depending on, again, how, what Thanksgiving you had, whether you had a nice hot meal like that sitting down at the table or you had the sea rations or you had, at least had the hot meal or you were still out uh, fighting the war. But from Amnon and myself, have a safe and happy Thanksgiving wherever you are and with whomever uh, you celebrate with. We all have something to be thankful for. So you go out and enjoy your Thanksgiving. Now, the Medal of Honor is the United States of America's highest and most prestigious personal uh, military decoration that may be awarded to recognize U.S. military service members who distinguish themselves by acts of valor. The medal is normally awarded by the President of the United States in the name of U.S. Congress. Because the medal is presented in the name of Congress, it is often referred to informally as the Congressional Medal of Honor. However, the official name of the current award is Medal of Honor. I hear people all the time, Congressional Medal of Honor. 
and I keep trying to, and sometimes I have to bite my tongue not to correct them, uh, but it is the Medal of Honor in the name of Congress. There have been 19 people awarded multiple medals of honor, all prior to 1918 when stricter regulations were placed on awarding the medal. Now, the, uh, the Army, the Navy, and Air Force, as you can see, there's a little bit difference in the medals of each one. They all mean the same thing. And as we watch, as we're going through the show tonight, I'm going to tell you I cheated. Uh, each person I'm going to be talking about, I show a Medal of Honor, but I did not necessarily go by service. I just put the first Medal of Honor that I got to and put it in it. So I uh, just want to tell you in advance so that anybody who's picked that up, that uh, I'm going to tell you in advance that uh, the branch of service does not always match the Medal of Honor with the picture and so forth. Okay. It is a military award, and civilians are not eligible to receive it. And as everything else, there's a caveat to that. This is true to an extent. Civilians have won it before, but they can't now. Several civilians who won the medal for acts during the Civil War, many of these medals were struck from the wreckage during the period from 1916 to 1919 as their services redefined what the Medal of Honor would be awarded for. In other words, people got it, but there's no record of it anymore. A few civilians did get their medals reinstated in the 1980s and 90s. Navy civilian ship pilots Martin Freeman and John Farrell, Army civilian Scout William Woodall and Mary Walker, a surgeon at the Battle of Bull Run, the only woman to get the medal so far. Uh, I have a chance, uh, I have an idea that's going to change very soon. So a civilian can't receive it now but there are some civilians who are legitimate recipients. Now, that would be a good trivia question for you out there if you want to uh, stump somebody. Okay. 3rd March, 1847, Congress authorized a certificate of merit be presented by the president when a private soldier distinguished himself in the service along with additional pay of $2 a month. I guess $2 a month meant a whole lot in 1847. 13 February 1861, Army Assistant Sergeant Bernard J.D. Irwin rescues the 60 soldiers of 2nd Lieutenant George Bascom unit at Apache Pass, Arizona. Though the Medal of Honor had not been proposed in Congress and actually wouldn't be even be presented until Irwin until 1894. So let's see, 1861. It only took 33 years for him to get his medal. Uh, you know, the, the VA works slow sometimes. It was the first heroic act for which the Medal of Honor would be awarded. Okay. Now, Jimmy Wayne Phillips, Private First Class, B Company, First Engineer Battalion, First Marine Division, uh, and I for, uh, forgot what the three uh, MAF is, a Marine something. I forgot what that is, so you're going to start skipping that unless you want a Marine and want to call in and tell me uh, what it is. I forgot. I have a senior moment. That's okay. Uh, United States Marine Corps from Culver City, California. Uh, he was born November 1st, 1950, and he was uh, uh, killed on May 27th, 1969. He's on the wall at panel West 20, line 2. As you can see there, the Medal of Honor. Uh, the picture of Jimmy in civilian clothes is his, uh, his late high school picture, 11th grade. This is from his sister. Jimmy left high school to join the Marines. He said they wanted to do something with his life, so my parents signed papers to let him join since he was only 17 at the time. Okay. Now, this is a citation. For conspicuous gallantry and interpreting, at the risk of his life above and beyond the call of duty while serving as a combat engineer with Company B, 1st Engineer Battalion, the 1st Marine Division, in connection with combat operations against the enemy in the Republic of Vietnam. On May 27, 1969, Private First Class Phipps was a member of a two-man combat engineer demolition team assigned to locate and destroy enemy artillery ordnance and conceal firing devices. After he had expended all of his explosive and blasting caps, Private First Class Phipps discovered a 175-millimeter high-explosive artillery round in a rice paddy. 
suspecting that the enemy had attached at the had attached at the military round to a secondary explosive device, he warned other Marines in the area to move to cover positions and prepare to destroy the round with a hand grenade. As he was attacking the as he was attaching the hand grenade to a stake beside the artillery round, the fuse of the enemy's secondary explosion device ignited. Realizing that his assistant and the platoon commander were both were a few meters from him of him or from him, that the imminent explosion would kill all three men. Private First Class Phipps grasped a hand grenade to his chest and dived forward to cover the enemy's explosion and artillery around with his body, thereby shielding his companions from the detonation while absorbing the full and tremendous impact with his own body. Private First Class Phipps' indomitable courage, inspiring initiative and selflessness, devotion and to duty saved the lives of two Marines and upheld the highest tradition of the Marine Corps and United States Naval Service. He gallantly gave his life for his country. Now, I'm going to go back and said, you know, he gallantly gave his life for the other two, his fellow Marines. Uh, his, his country was uh, of secondary, but it was for his fellow Marines that were there with him. Uh, that's my opinion, and I'm sticking with it, okay? Now, Larry Stanley Pierce, he was a staff sergeant. Headquarters, headquarters company, 1st Battalion, 503rd Infantry, 173rd Airborne. Army United States, he was from Taft, California. Uh, born July 6, 1941 to September 20th, 1965. That made him 24. Uh, Larry S. Pierce is on the wall at panel 2 East, line 91. That was early on. That's that's him in his, in his fancy uniform there, and then that's him. Uh, in Vietnam with his 173rd um, uh, sticker on, okay? Now, this is his citation. Sergeant Pierce's official Medal of Honor citation reads, for conspicuous, conspicuous gallantry and integrity at the risk of life and above and beyond the call of duty, Sergeant Pierce was serving as squad leader in a reconnaissance platoon when his patrol was ambushed by hostile forces. Through his inspiring leadership and personal courage, the squad succeeded in eliminating the enemy machine gun and routing the opposing force. While pursuing the fleeing enemy, the squad came upon a dirt road, and as the main body of his men entered the road, Sergeant Pierce discovered an anti-personnel mine emplaced in the roadbed, IEDs back then. Realizing that the mine could destroy the majority of his squad, Sergeant Pierce saved the lives of his men and the sacrifice of his own life by throwing himself directly into the mine as it exploded. Through his indomitable courage, complete disregard for his safety, and profound concern for his fellow soldiers, he averted loss of life and injury to the members of his squad. Sergeant Pierce's extraordinary heroism at the cost of his life or in the highest tradition of the United States Army and reflect great credit upon himself and the armed forces of his country. Now, we did, the first two men we've already talked about are very, un, very unselfish, uh, what they did for their uh, fellow, fellow soldiers. The casual date was, uh, we'll talk about, he started his tour at 3 4 1965. Uh, he was killed a little over six months later. He was 24 years old, Bing Dong province in South Vietnam. Okay. Riley Leroy Pitts, Captain C, Ca Captain C Company, 2nd Battalion, 27th Entry, 25th Infantry Division, United States Army Republic of Vietnam. Army United States from Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, uh, from October 15, 1937, when he was born, to October 31st, 1967. He's on the wall at panel 28 East, line 105. If you were facing the wall, that'd be to your right. Captain Riley Leroy Pitts was a man of leadership and compassion. He truly cared for his men who he led into battle. A kindness he showed wherever he spoke to, whenever he spoke of his family. A proud and dedicated family man. But on the battlefield, he was a true warrior and a fearless leader. In the finest of wolfhound tradition, his presence is missed by all who knew him. I know this well because I was his radio operator, Charlie Six X-Ray. Rest well, my wolfhound brother, from his RTO and wolfhound brother, Roger B. Gates. 
That was the man who traveled along with him and carried his radio. This is a citation. It says, distinguishing himself by exceptional heroism while serving as company commander during an air mobile assault. Immediately after his company landed in the area, several Viet Cong opened fire with automatic weapons. Despite the enemy fire, Captain Pitts forcefully led an assault which overran the enemy positions. Shortly thereafter, Captain Pitts was ordered to move his unit to the north to reinforce another company heavily engaged against a strong enemy force. As Captain Pitts' company moved forward to engage the enemy, intense fire was received from three different directions, including fire from four enemy bunkers, two of which were within 15 meters of Captain Pitts' position. The severity of the incoming fire prevented Captain Fitz from maneuvering his company, his rifle fire uh, providing ineffective, proving ineffective against the enemy due to the dense jungle foliage. He picked up an M79 grenade launcher and began pinpointing the targets. Seizing a Chinese communist grenade, which had been taken from a captured Viet Cong's web gear, Captain Pitts lobbed the grenade at a bunker to his front but it hit the dense jungle foliage and rebounded. Without hesitation, Captain Pitts threw himself on top of the grenade, which fortunately failed to explode. Captain Pitts then directed the reposition of his company to permit friendly artillery to be fired. Upon completion of the artillery fire mission, Captain Pitts again led his men towards the enemy positions, personally killing at least one more Viet Cong. The jungle growth still prevented effective fire to be placed on the enemy bunker. Captain Pitts, displaying complete disregard for his life and personal safety, quickly moved to a position which permitted him to place effective fire on the enemy. He maintained a continuous fire, pinpointing the enemy's fortified position while at the same time directing and urging his men forward until he was mortally wounded. Captain Pitt's conspicuous gallantry, extraordinary heroism, and intrepidity at the cost of his life above and beyond the call of duty are in the highest tradition of the United States Army and reflect great credit upon himself, his unit, and the armed forces of his country. There's a lot this already. We've already talked about some men that uh, just went above and beyond. You can't do much more than give your life. William David Hort, Sergeant, C Company, 5th Battalion, 7th Cav, 1st Cavalry Division, United States Army of Vietnam. And if you remember, the first, 7th Cav was the guys that were in, um, uh, originally were in the Idrang Valley for, uh, with, the, with the book and the movie, We Were Soldiers Once. Uh, he was from Elizabethtown, Pennsylvania. He was born uh, October 31st, 1941. You can see his gravestone there. Now, the incident was January 12th. But up there at the top, it says November 27th, 1868, 1968. Okay, we're going to see why there's a difference in a minute. He is on panel 34 East, line 39. This is a citation. For conspicuous gallantry and intrepidity at the risk of his life above and beyond the call of duty, Sergeant Port extinguished himself while serving as a rifleman with Company C, 5th Battalion, 7th Cavalry, which was conducting combat operations against the enemy force in the Quezon Valley. As Sergeant Port's platoon was moving to cut off the reported movement of enemy soldiers, the, plat the platoon came under heavy fire from an entrenched enemy force. Now, that means they were dug in uh, very well, foxholes and, and, and trenches and so forth. The platoon was forced to withdraw due to the intensity and ferocity of the fire. Although wounded in the hand as the, with, as the withdrawal began, Sergeant Port with complete disregard for his safety, ran through the heavy fire to assist a wounded comrade back to the safety of the platoon perimeter. As the enemy forces assaulted the perimeter, Sergeant Port and three comrades were in position behind an embankment where an enemy grenade landed in their midst. Sergeant Port, realizing the danger to his fellow soldiers, shouted the warning, grenade, and unhesitantly hurled himself towards the grenade to shield his comrades from the explosion. Through his exemplary courage and devotion, he saved the lives of his fellow soldiers and gave the members of his platoon the inspiration needed to hold their position. Sergeant Port's selfishness, selfless 
concern for his comrades at the risk of his own uh, life above and beyond the call of duty are in keeping with the highest tradition of the military service and reflected great credit upon himself. Now, Agent Loss was 27, based on date declared dead. Quang Nam Providence uh, remains 1968, the body not recovered and was found later. So he was not officially declared dead until after uh, they were able to go back and find the body. That was the reason that uh, there was a, a discrepancy in the date declared dead. Uh, repatriated in 1985, he was identified uh, in 2007, 1985. Uh, okay. As noted above, on January 12th, 1968, a platoon of Company C, 5th and 7th Cavalry was engaged by enemy troops and forced to withdraw pending reinforcements with four men missing. When C Company troopers returned to the field of battle, they recovered three of the men but could not locate the body of PFC William D. Port, who was known to have thrown himself on a hand grenade and he was believed dead. The four men were Benjamin F. McClary, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, Lee R. Danielson, Cadott, Wisconsin, Sergeant William D. Port, Elizabethtown, Pennsylvania, and Corporal James Costelli, Costel Diddy, uh, Camden, New Jersey. Uh, they found their remains, but was unable to find uh, Sergeant Hortz. Now, up there it says PFC, uh, that he was uh, promoted uh, posthumously uh, as, we went, as, as time was going on until they found his body. Much later, the North Vietnamese provided a listing of prisoners who had died in captivity. PFC's port's name was on the list with a date of death of 27 November 1968. His capture and subsequent death while a POW were confirmed when Captain Floyd H. Kushner and Warrant Officer Francis G. Anton were repatriated on 16th of March 1973. They were with PFC Port when he died. He was buried in a common grave, which reportedly uh, eight other U.S. prisoners. He survived the blast, but died in captivity. In 1985, a joint U.S.-Vietnamese team excavated the grave site and recovered human remains. Those remains were among those released to the United States on, on 14th of August, 1985. Over the next several months, 24 missing Americans were identified. 11 naval aviators, eight Air Force flyers, one Marine infantryman, and four soldiers. William D. Port was one of the soldiers. He is buried in Section 7, Arlington National Cemetery. William Thomas Perkins, you can see him up there in his, uh, his Marine uniform and then his civilian. Uh, uh, he is from, he was uh, Service Company Headquarters Battalion, 3rd uh, Marine Division. Uh, he was a corporal uh, from, yeah. Sepula, Sepula Veta, California. Uh, folks, I know I'm killing some of these pronunciations, but uh, my southern tongue doesn't say some of these. Oh, that's Yeah, that's what whatever Amnon just said. Uh, William T. Perkins, Jr. is on the wall at panel 27 East, line 97. He enlisted in the Marine Corps Reserve in 1966 and went on active duty on July 6, 1966, upon the completion of a recruit training at the Marine Corps Recruit Depot, San Diego, California. He was promoted to private first class in summer of 1966. He was reassigned to the Marine Corps Base Camp Pendleton, California, as some Marines call that Hollywood Marines, where he underwent individual combat training. After completion of training and until January 1967, he served as a photographer with Headquarters Battalion, Marine Corps Supply Center, Barstow, Cal Barstow California. He was pr promoted to Lance Corporal 1st of January, 1967, and for the next four months, uh, Lance Corporal Perkins was a student of the Motion Picture Photography Course at the United States Army Signal School at Fort Monmouth, New Jersey. This is his uh, citation for service is set forth in the following citation. For conspicuous gallantry and intrepidity, at the risk of his life above and beyond the call of duty while serving as a combat photographer attached to Company C, 1st Battalion, 1st Marines, 1st Marine Division in the Republic of Vietnam on 12th October, 1967. 
during Operation Medina, a major reconnaissance in force southwest of Quang Tri, Company C, made heavy combat uh, contact with a numerically superior North Vietnamese Army force estimated at two to three companies. The focal point of the intense fighting was a helicopter landing zone, which was also serving as the command post of Company C. In the course of a strong hostile attack, an enemy grenade landed in the immediate area occupied by Corporal Perkins and the three other Marines. Realizing the inherent danger, he shouted a warning, incoming grenade, to his fellow Marines in a uh, valiant act of heroism, hurled himself upon the grenade, absorbing the impact of the explosion with his own body, thereby saving the lives of his comrades at the cost of his own. Through his exceptional courage and inspired valor in the face of certain death, Corporal Perkins reflected great credit upon himself and the Marine Corps and upheld the highest traditions of the United States Naval Service. He gallantly died. He gallantly gave his life for his country by Richard M. Nixon. His cat, he was 20 years old. As by, it was Quantree Providence. You would think that a photographer would be, have been a nice, safe place, wouldn't you? Uh, we've had on here several times uh, Del Vecchio, who was also a combat photographer, who also got uh, wounded a couple of times. So uh, there were no safe places, depending on your job. It may have sounded like it was pretty good, but when you got there, you found that uh, it's like a Navy corpsman. They, they are actually uh, go out with the Marines because the Marines don't have any corpsmen. Danny John Peterson, Specialist 4, B Company 4th Battalion, 23rd Infantry, 25th Infantry Division, United States Army Republic of Vietnam, from Atchison, Kansas, born March 11, 1949. Danny J. Peterson on the wall, West 14, Line 20. Now, this is his citation. Specialist 4, Peterson distinguished himself while serving as a armored personnel carrier commander. That's a little box with with um, with tracks on it uh, to ride around in. It, you can ride inside, but every time I was on one, we always rode up on top. Uh, there's not a, it, it's metal, but there's not a whole lot of stopping power on an armored personnel carrier. He was a commander with Company B during a combat operation against a North Vietnamese Army force estimated to be a battalion size, which is a large group of men. During the initial contact with the enemy, an armored personnel carrier was disabled and the crewmen were pinned down by the heavy onslaught of enemy small arms, automatic weapons, and rocket-propelled grenades fire. Specialist 4 Peterson immediately maneuvered his armored personnel carrier to position between his disabled vehicle and the enemy. He placed suppressive fire on the enemy's well-fortified positions, thereby enabling the crew members of the disabled personnel carrier to repair their vehicle. He then maneuvered his vehicle while still under heavy hostile fire to within 10 feet of the enemy's defensive emplacement. After a period of intense fighting, his vehicle received a direct hit and the driver was wounded. With extraordinary courage and selfishness, selfish disregard for his own safety, Specialist 4 Peterson carried his wounded comrade 45 meters across a bullet swept field to a secure area. He then voluntarily returned to his disabled armored personnel carrier to provide covering fire for, uh, for both the other vehicles and the dismounted personnel of his, own, of his platoon as they withdrew. Despite heavy fire from three sides, he remained with his disabled vehicles alone and completely exposed. Specialist 4 Peterson was standing on top of his vehicle, firing his weapon when he was mortally wounded. His heroic and selfishness, selfish Actions prevented further loss of life to his platoon. Special Paul Peterson, conspicuous gallantry and extraordinary heroism are in the highest tradition of the service and reflected great credit upon him, him, his unit in the United States Army. Peterson's age 20 of his death was buried in Nitawaka Cemetery, Nitawaka, Kansas. A portion of U.S. 75 near Nitawaka is named the Danny J. Peterson Memorial Highway in his honor. Lance David Peters, good-looking guy. Second platoon, M Company, 3rd Battalion, 5th Marines, 1st Marine Division, uh, United States Marine Corps from Binghamton, New York. 
born September 16th, 1966. You can see his uh, headstone there. He is on the wall, panel 25 East, line 108. This is his citation for his Medal of Honor. For conspicuous gallantry and intrepidity at the risk of his life above beyond the call of duty while serving as a squad leader with Company M, 3rd Battalion, 5th Marines, during Operation Swift. The Marines of the 2nd Platoon of Company M were struck by intense mortar, machine gun, and small arms fire from an entrenched enemy force. As the company rattled its forces, Sergeant Peters maneuvered his squad in an assault of an enemy defended knoll. Disregarding his safety as enemy rounds hit all around him, he stood in the open, pointed out any positions until he was painfully wounded in the leg. Disregarding his wound, he moved forward and continued to lead his men. As the enemy fire increased in accuracy and volume, his squad lost its momentum and was temporarily pinned down. Exposing himself to a devastating enemy fire, he consolidated his position to render more effective fire. While directing the base of fire, he was wounded a second time in the face and neck from an exploding mortar round. As the enemy attempted to infiltrate the position of an adjacent platoon, Sergeant Peters stood erect in the full view of the enemy, firing burst after burst forcing them to disclose their camouflage positions. Sergeant Peters steadfastly continued to direct his squad in spite of two additional wounds, persisted in his efforts to encourage and supervise men until he lost consciousness and succumbed. Man, it was quite a leader. Inspired by his selfish action, the squad regained fire superiority and once again carried the assault to the enemy. By his astounding, outstanding valor, Indomitable fighting spirit and tenacious determination in the face of overwhelming odds, Sergeant Peters upheld the highest tradition of the Marine Corps, the United States Naval Service. He gallantly gave his life for his country. As noted, Delta 1st and 5th Marines bore the brunt of the initial North Vietnamese attack. The assertion of additional Marine forces as the day progressed could do little to alleviate the situation. Mike and Kilo, the third of the fifth, moving into position from the landing zone to the northwest and encountered NVA blocking forces. Mike, third of the fifth, fought a sharp engagement at, at Chulam, about two kilometers east of the Delta, the first of the fifth engagement at, at Dong Som. By the time fighting petered out after nightfall, 53 Marines and sailors had died. 36 of the U.S. dead were from the 1st Battalion, 5th Marines. They paid a high price. And as you can see, there was also another uh, Lieutenant Vincent R. Capodano Capodano from Honolulu, Hawaii. He also received the Medal of Honor there. And uh, his group lost 17 men. Also, M Company, that's the men they lost. That was uh, Peters we just talked about, got the Medal of Honor. Uh, the Corman, HM3. Uh, it's a Navy uh, rank. Uh, he received the Navy Cross, which is the next medal under the uh, Medal of Honor. Uh, Lance Corporal Thomas W. Fisher, Allentown, Pennsylvania, Navy Cross. Lance Corporal Andrew M. Giordano, Smithtown, New York, a Silver Star. So, so there was a lot, a lot of men uh, stood up for their country uh, during that battle. Now, this is the uh, lieutenant that was killed. Uh, he's not just any lieutenant, uh, as you can probably see in just a moment. If you look closely at the picture, at his collar, Vincent Robert Capadano, Lieutenant, H&S Company, 3rd Battalion, 5th Marines, 1st Marine Division, United States Navy, Honolulu, Hawaii. He was born February 13, 1929. He is on the wall at East Panel 25, Line 95. And as you can see in the picture there, Father Vincent Capadano is buried in the St. Peter's Cemetery, West New Brighton, Richmond County, Staten Island, New York. But there is standing in front of a uh, nativity scene. Uh, so you can get the idea that he was a chaplain. Now, this is his uh, citation for the Medal of Honor. For conspicuous gallantry and intrepidity at the risk of his life above and beyond the call of duty as chaplain of the 3rd Battalion in connection with operations against enemy forces. In response to reports that the 2nd Platoon of M Company 
was in danger of being overrun by a mass enemy assault force, Lieutenant Capadano left the relative safety of the company command post and ran through an open area rake with fire directly to the beleaguered platoon. Disregarding the intense enemy small arms, automatic weapons, and mortar fire, he moved around the battlefield, administering last rites to the dying and giving medical aid to the wounded. When an exploding mortar round inflicted painful multiple wounds to his arms and legs and, and severed a portion of his right hand, he steadfastly refused all medical aid. Instead, he directed the corpsmen to help their wounded comrades with calm vigor. I continued to move about the battlefield as he provided encouragement by voice and examples to the valiant Marines. Upon encountering a wounded corpsman in the direct line of fire of an enemy machine gun, positioned approximately 15 yards away, Lieutenant Capadano rushed in a daring attempt to aid and assist a mortally wounded corpsman. At that instant, only inches from his goal, he was struck down by a burst of, of machine gun fire. By his heroic and conduct on the battlefield and his inspiring example, Lieutenant Capadano upheld the highest tradition of the United States Navy service. He gallantly gave his life to the cause of freedom. Father Capadano died in an effort to assist hospital corpsman third class Armando Lille received a posthumously Navy cross for his heroism that day. Robert Leslie Poxon. You see him in his civilian clothes, his military picture, and then you see him in the jungles of Vietnam there. First Lieutenant, Arrow Rifle Platoon, B Troop, 1st Squadron, 9th Cavalry, 1st Cavalry Division, Army of the United States from Detroit, Michigan. He was born January 3rd, 1947. He is on the wall, uh, West 23, Line 46. Medal of Honor Citation. For conspicuous gallantry, an intrepidity in action at the risk of his life above and beyond the call of duty. First Lieutenant Poxon, armor, Troop B, distinguished himself while serving as a platoon leader on a reconnaissance mission. Landing by helicopter in an area suspected of being occupied by the enemy, the platoon came under intense fire from the enemy soldiers in concealed positions and fortifications around the landing zone. A soldier fell, hit by the first burst of fire. First Lieutenant Poxon dashed to his aid, drawing the majority of the enemy fires across 20 meters of open ground. The fallen soldier was beyond help, and First Lieutenant Poxon was seriously and painfully wounded. First Lieutenant Poxon, with indomitable courage, refused medical aid and evacuation and turned his attention to seizing the initiative from the enemy. With such instinct, he marked a central enemy bunker as the key to success. Quickly instructed his men to con concentrate their fire on the bunker, and in spite of his wounds, the First Lieutenant Poxon crawled towards the bunker, ready to hand grenade and, a char and charged. He was hit again, but continued his assault. After succeeding in silence the enemy guns in the bunker, he was struck once again by enemy fire and fell, mortally wounded. First Lieutenant Poxon, comrades followed their leader and pressed the attack and drove the enemy from the positions. First Lieutenant Poxon's gallantry, indomitable will, and courage are in the keeping with the highest tradition of the military and service and reflect great credit on himself and his unit in the United States Army. You can see his grave there. Casualty date, start, he started 10-10-1968. Uh, incident date and casual date was 6 uh, 2 1969. He was getting short. Uh, lo location was Tainan Province in South Vietnam. William Hart Pittsburgher. Now, they call him Pitts. Now, I'm going to tell you there is a movie coming out in January about this young man. Uh, can, I think it's coming, uh, it's going to be out at the theaters uh, January 27th, if I believe it is. But let me tell you about him because then you're going to want to go see the movie. William Hart Pittsburgh, Staff Sergeant, 38th Army. Okay, I don't know what that one is either. Uh, third, oh, okay. Uh, third Air Rescue Group. In other words, he was the United States Air Force. He was a pair rescue. He's one of those guys that went down with no weapons, basically, to help the wounded guys on the ground. 
He is from Piqua, Ohio. He was born July 8, 1944. He's on the panel 6E, line 102. He was, in, as you can see there, he's getting some kind of metal uh, uh, pinned to him uh, there in Vietnam with his hat on, and that's him, uh, Air Force and so forth. You know, we tease the Air Force, and we say that they got, uh, instead of combat pay, sometimes they got inconvenience pay. Well, this man has proven that uh, the Air Force pulled their part because he did more than pull his part. This is his citation. Airman First Class Pitsenbarger distinguished himself by an extreme valor on 11th of April, 1966, near Cam Mai, Republic of Vietnam, while assigned as a pararescue crew member on Detachment 6, 38th Aero, uh, Aerospace Rescue and Recovery uh, Squadron, which has now just told you what those ARR was. Uh, on that date, Airman Pittsburgh was aboard a rescue helicopter responding to a call for evacuation of casualties incurring in an ongoing firefight between elements of the United States Army's 1st Division and a sizable enemy force approximately 35 miles east of Saigon. With complete risk, disregard for personal safety, Airman Pittsburgh volunteered to ride a hoist more than 100 feet through the uh, jungle to the ground. Now, that would make him a really good target, wouldn't it? On the ground, he organized and coordinated rescue efforts, cared for the wounded, prepared casualties for evacuation, and ensured that the recovery operation continued in a smooth and orderly fashion. Through his personal efforts, the evacuation of the wounded was greatly expedited. As each of the nine casualties evacuated that day were recovered, Pittsburgh refused evacuation in order to get one more wounded soldier to safety. After several pickups, one of the two rescue helicopters involved in evacuation was struck by heavy enemy ground fire and was forced to leave the scene for an emergency landing. Airman Pittsburgh stayed behind on the ground to perform medical duties. Shortly thereafter, the area came under sniper and mortar fire. During a subsequent attempt to evacuate the site, American forces came under heavy assault by a large Viet Cong force. When the enemy launched the assault, the evacuation was called off and Airman Pittsburgh took up arms with the besieged infantrymen. He courageously resisted the enemy braving intense gunfire to gather and distribute battle ammunition to American defenders. As the battle raged on, he repeatedly exposed himself to enemy fire to care for the wounded pulled them out of the line of fire, and returned fire whenever he could, during which time he was wounded three times. Despite his wounds, he valiantly fought on, simultaneously treating as many wounded as possible. In a vicious fighting which followed, the American forces suffered 80% casualties as their perimeter was breached, and Airman Pitsenbarger was finally fatally wounded. Airman Pitsenbarger exposed himself to almost certain death by staying on the ground and perished while saving the lives of wounded infantrymen. His bravery and determination exemplified the highest professional standards and traditions of military service and reflect great credit upon himself, his unit, and the United States Air Force. Friends comment. This is something that was online. Uh, most of the information I'm giving you uh, today I got from uh, the virtual wall. It's a list of everybody that's on the wall and, and their stories, but not all of it came from that. Uh, this is from a friend. On April 11th, 1966, 21-year-old Airman First Class William H. Parsons of Piqua, Ohio, was killed while defending some of his wounded comrades. For his bravery and sacrifice, he was posthumously awarded the nation's second highest medal decoration, the Air Force Cross. Pitts, as was known to his friends, was nearing his 300th combat mission on that fateful day. When some of the men of the United States Army's 1st Division was ambushed and pinned down in the area about 45 miles east of Saigon, two HH-43 Husky helicopters of the United States Air Force 38th Aerospace Rescue and Recovery Squadron were rushed to the scene to lift out the wounded. Pitts was a pararescue man, a PJ, uh, on one of them. Upon reaching the site of the ambush, Pitts was lowered through the trees to the ground where he was attended to the wounded before having them lifted to the helicopter by cable. After six wounded men had been flown to an aid station, the two United States Air Force helicopters returned to the second for the second loads. 
As one of them lowered its litter basket to Pittsburgh, which who had remained on the ground with the 20 infantry still alive, it was hit by a burst of enemy fire, enemy small arms fire. When its engine began to lose power, the pilot realized he had to get the Husky away from the area as soon as possible. Instead of climbing to the litter basket so he could leave with the helicopter, Pitts elected to remain with the Army troops under heavy attack and gave a wave off to the helicopter, which flew away to safety. Pitts continued to treat the wounded, and when the others began running low on ammunition, he gathered ammo clips from the dead and distributed them to those still alive. Then he joined the others with a rifle to hold off the Viet Cong. About 7.30 p.m. that evening, Bill Pittsburgh was killed by a Viet Cong sniper. When his body was recovered the next day, one hand still held a rifle and the other held a medical kit. Airman First Class William H. Pittsburgh was a PGA who participated in more than 300 rescue missions. In Vietnam, para-jumpers were all volunteers, earned more than decorations per capita than any the other group of United States Air Force personnel. William Raymond Prom, Lance Corporal, I Company, 3rd Battalion, 3rd Marines, 3rd Marine Division, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, born November 17, 1948. William was on the uh, is on the wall at West 32 Line 2, as you can see him there in his Marine uniform, uh, his brown uniform, and then up in the a picture, the formal picture in his dress uniform. Now, this is his citation for conspicuous gallantry and intrepidity at the risk of his life above and beyond the call of duty while serving as a Marine Gun Squad Leader with Company I, Third Battalion, Third Marines. 3rd Marine Division in action against the enemy in the Republic of Vietnam. While returning from a reconnaissance operation on 9 February 1969 during Operation Taylor Common, two platoons of Company I came under attack uh, under an intense automatic weapons fire and grenade attack from a well-concealed North Vietnamese Army force in the fortified positions. The leading element of the platoon was isolated and several Marines were wounded. Lance Corporal Prom immediately assumed control of one of the machine guns and began to deliver return fire. Disregarding his own safety, he advanced to a position from which he could more effectively deliver covering fire while first aid was being administered to the wounded men. Realizing that the enemy would have to be destroyed before the injured Marines could be evacuated, Lance Corporal Prom again moved and delivered a heavy volume of fire with such accuracy that he was instrumental in routing the enemy. Thus permitting his men to regroup and resume the march shortly thereafter, the platoon again, the platoon again came under heavy fire in which one man was critically wounded. Reacting instantly, Lance Corporal Prom moved forward to protect his injured comrade. Unable to continue his own fire because of his severe wounds, he continued to advance to within a few yards of the enemy position. There, standing in full view of the enemy, he accurately directed the fire of his support elements until he was mortally wounded. Inspired by his heroic actions, the Marines launched an assault that destroyed the enemy. Lance Corporal Prom's indomitable courage, inspired initiative, and selfishness devotion to duty upheld the highest tradition of the Marine Corps and the United States Naval Service. He gallantly gave his life for his country. He was presented the medal by Richard M. Nixon, or his family was. Robert Joseph Pruden, Staff Sergeant, G Company, 7th Infantry, Marical Division, Army of the United States, St. Paul, Minnesota, born September 9, 1949. Uh, Robert Pruden is on the wall, West 16, Line 102. And you can see uh, the, him there. Uh, looks like he's in a helicopter getting ready to go out uh, and so forth. And, and, and of course, his headstone. Right? This is his citation. For conspicuous gallantry and intrepidity in action at the risk of his life above and beyond the call of duty, Staff Sergeant Pruden, Company G, distinguished himself while serving as a reconnaissance team leader during an ambush mission. The six-man team was inserted by helicopter into enemy-controlled territory to establish an ambush position and to obtain information concerning enemy movements. As the team moved into the prepared area, Staff Sergeant Pruden 
deployed his men into two groups on opposite sides of a well-used trail. You never go down the trail. As the groups were establishing the defensive positions, one member of the team was trapped in the open by the heavy fire from an enemy squad. Realizing that the ambush positions had been compromised, Staff Sergeant Pruden directed his team to open fire on the enemy force. Immediately, the team came under heavy fire from second enemy element. Staff Sergeant Pruden, with full knowledge of the extreme danger involved, left his concealed position and firing as he ran, advanced towards the enemy to draw hostile fire. He was seriously wounded twice, but continued his attack until he fell for a third time in front of the enemy positions. Staff Sergeant Pruden action resulted in several enemy casualties and withdrawal of the remaining enemy forces. Although grievously wounded, he directed his men into defense positions and called for evacuation helicopters, which safely withdrew the members of his team. Staff Sergeant Pruden's outstanding courage, selfishness, concern for the welfare of his men and intrepidity in action at the cost of his life were in keeping with the highest tradition of the military service and reflect great credit upon himself in the United States Army. You see, he started, uh, his tour started third, uh, let's see, January, February, March 6, 26, 1969. He was getting short and eight, he'd been there eight months. Uh, and when he was killed, he was 20 years old when he was killed. So that is, gives you an idea of uh, some of the others. Now, I'm going to stop right here at, the, at, uh, at Laszlo Rebel, Staff Sergeant. We're going to uh, continue doing uh, part three, four, and five, uh, but I don't want to uh, run out of time tonight uh, for uh, 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 talk a little bit about these men. Uh, these men uh, make you glad to be an American, uh, make you glad to be a uh, United States soldier in my class, uh, situation, that these men did the things they did and why they did we have we need to be thankful tomorrow at thanksgiving to knowing that we have men out there like this and as women get more involved in combat they also one. it's a special time when we give thanks we give thanks for a lot of different things uh also tomorrow as we give uh thanks for our thanksgiving remember the soldiers who uh, like when I was in Vietnam, who ate sea rations in the jungle, uh, everybody can't sit down to a nice hot uh, turkey with cranberry sauce and stuffings and so forth because they're out there still, as I showed you a while ago, the war is still going on. Now, there's a couple of things going up before we meet again. Uh, on December the 8th, if you're anywhere in the Raleigh area, uh, the uh, monthly POWMI ceremony, which we've been doing for almost 33 years now, will be held at 12 o'clock noon at the, uh, huh? Amnon is having senioritis. It is 12, 12 o'clock noon for December 8th ceremony. We're not, got, I haven't gotten to candlelight yet. You're ahead of me. The regular monthly ceremony is at 12 o'clock, as always. I know, but December 8th. First Saturday. First Saturday, 8th. Okay, I thought you told me the 7th. See? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Man, man, telling me stories again already. Let me go back. We'll blah, 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 run that back. Okay, we run that tape back on December 7th, which is the first Saturday of the month, whatever day that happens to be. We will be doing the ceremony at the state capitol where we remember the names and and of the 38 from North Carolina whose families still do not know what happened to them. Now, that is at 12 o'clock noon. We will be doing the show again December 11th. That will be our last show for the year. Uh, but after that, we'll be having a candlelight service at 6 o'clock where we'll be doing a uh, lighting of candles and a special ceremony. If you're anywhere around, I highly recommend that you come down and Take part in that ceremony. It starts at six o'clock, so you can see the candles lit. After the show. Not after the show. No, that's the eleventh is on the show in the in the era, and the now you got me yeah. on the fifteenth is the candlelight service. Okay, you get you're getting me more confused all the time. It's a good thing we're about to end the show. Now I have a very special guest coming in. By the way, the the eleventh of December show. We're not going to do a show on Christmas Day, which will be the next show date. Our next show after the 11th of December will be January 8th. So 
Uh, we're going to have a special guest here on the 11th, and then we won't see each other until next year. But we're going to have Colonel Andrew R. Finlayson, United States Marine Corps retired. He spent 32 months in South Vietnam. He has written two books, and he knows about as much, if not more, than anybody I've ever seen about the Vietnam War. He served in all kinds of different positions over the times that he was in Vietnam. Uh, let's see, during his career as a Marine colonel, uh, Finlayson commanded a variety of units to include a ground reconnaissance platoon, a ceremonial guard platoon, two infantry companies, an infantry battalion, a light armored vehicle battalion, and a recruit training retirement uh, regiment. His staff assignment was principally involved with the manpower and operation to include national-level war planning. He retired from the United States Marine Corps in 1991, then he started a new job as an advisor for in Iraq, Afghanistan, and a whole bunch of other places. Uh, in, uh, let's see, turn this over real quick. In uh, 2008, he won the CIA's Prestigious Studies an intelligence award for his article entitled Tainan Province Reconnaissance Unit in the Phoenix Program, 1969-1970. Right there is enough to make you tune in because this man is awesome. Uh, for Colonel of the Marines, he's going to be talking about his two books. Uh, the first one is uh, Killer Kane. Uh, the reconnaissance group had more uh, uh, confirmed kills than any other reconnaissance group. Uh, during the Vietnam War. So that book is the a Marine lo uh, Long Range Recon Team Leader in Vietnam, 1967-68. And then he's going to have the next book is 19 uh, Rice Paddy Recon, a Marine Officer's Second Tour in Vietnam, 1968-1970. Andrew R. Finlayson, I am looking forward to having the Colonel on. Uh, be sure to tell all your friends out there uh, to take tune uh, to, and be sure to call and ask him some questions. Cause like I said, he knows more about the Vietnam war. Uh, I met him at the conference in Atlanta where I went down for the uh, Vietnam conference by the, uh, the, the guys that are the Vietnam veterans for factory history uh, where they get out there and trying to tell a real story out there. So I hope that uh, you enjoyed tonight's show. Uh, I enjoyed putting it together. It's amazing when you start reading about these heroes and the, uh, knowing that they, when they did what they did, they were going to lose their life. But at the same time, they gave up their life for their fellow soldier and uh, their country uh, after that and, and family and so forth. So, again, I uh, hope the great turkey is good to you tomorrow. Don't overeat. Uh, enjoy. And if you're out there and you are having problems, uh, as we sometimes uh, do on uh, uh, holidays like this, please reach out and get help. There's help out there. There's another soldier out there looking to help you because uh, we've been, a lot of us have been through some of the stuff. There's also the uh, helpline that we talked about before. But please reach out. Don't let Thanksgiving get you down if you're out there and, and need help. There's somebody out there wanting to uh, help you give thanks. So, uh, Amnon, I guess we're going to sign off until uh, de December 11th. And, yeah, and he, he, I, you know, uh, I want to ask you, how do you, you know how to keep a turkey in suspense? No, I don't. Okay. Well, now you know he's in suspense. Uh, all right. Good night. You are tuned to the Nissan Communications Network. If you tuned in too late, you can always watch each program in its entirety or download an MP3 audio file of it in the archive section at nissancommunications.com. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow us on Twitter, and like us on Facebook. Sponsored by Telestream's Wirecast Software, StreamingGear.com, Carolina Apparel, and DeltaForce.net.